Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Pastor Lapine requested that we show our presentation tonight. I would encourage you, please come. It won't be a long meeting. The presentation is only eight and a half minutes long. And uh, we're excited to share that with you. But we are here to thank you for your prayers. Even though we are in a wheelchair... We try our best to do our part so God can do his. And we have seen souls saved, church plant, churches planted, folks that we've led to Christ go on to uh, a Bible school and seminary, and they're now in the ministry, and it is very exciting. The, reason, the main reason we are on the mission field is to lead people to Christ so that they can experience eternal life like we have. And I hope and pray that everyone present this morning has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to because that is the only way that you will be able to enter heaven's gates. God has done his part. Now you must do yours. In accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. We have to look beyond death's door. We have to glimpse into eternity and realized what it will be like on the other side. Number one, without Christ. Number two, with Christ. And the choice is obvious. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 10. Verse 10 will be here, as Pastor Lapine said, all day. Go back to our display. Please pick up a new little prayer card. We have small prayer cards, business card size, not because we're cheap, but we, we came up with the idea is that you can carry the card with you in your purse, in your wallet. It won't take up a lot of space. You have some downtime somewhere waiting for someone. Pull it out, pray for us. Our email is on there, our blog is on there, and Baptist Missions address is on there also. John chapter 10, verse 10. Let us rise for the reading of God's word, if you can. John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Heavenly Father, may we direct our hearts and minds towards you at this moment. Teach us, Lord. And if there be a decision we must make to honor you, Lord, that it might be made. We pray for that one who is here seeking, that they will accept you as their Savior before they leave here today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you very much. First point of our message this morning is leave the past in the past. So many people come in and it's normal for a pastor to have a time set apart during the week when folks can come in seeking counsel 
And I would say eight or nine times out of ten, the problems or problem that those per, that person is experiencing is because they are having trouble getting over something that happened to them in the past. And as ministers of the Word of God, we have to talk it out with them, open the Word of God, pray with them, and show them that it is not impossible to leave the past in the past. And we can only experience the abundant life that Christ has for us as sons and daughters of the King. If we do turn the page, if we do leave the past in the past, one theologian explained it this way. Every year of your life is a chapter in your book. And the amount of pages in that chapter depends on us. Sometimes there are three or four chapters on one page because We've been a long time in not leaving the past in the past. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I have count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the high prize for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not one to forgive easily. And some people say, oh, it's easy for you. I said, really? My dad came to speak in a conference when I was 14 years old. He, church in Florida paid for his way up and back down to Brazil, and he came up, he brought a present from Florida for each one of my, my brother and my three sisters, and he brought one for me too. I didn't like the present he gave me. I still have it though. It's an alligator, and it had an inscription on one of those little plastic alligators, you know, you buy down in Florida at the tourist traps, and it said, I don't, I don't get mad, I just get even, and that was me. And it probably still is to some extent. I don't get mad. I just wait until the person forgets it, and then I, I, do, I show them how to do it. And that's not right. And I guess I was upset, mostly because... It was true. On July 3rd, Sunday evening, 10 years ago, I had preached the evening service message and I stepped outside the building greeting people as they left. We were in a small village of about 3,000 people. Hard access when it rained. We didn't have bridges to cross, so we either waited for the water to go down or just went through the water and hoped we didn't float downstream. The drug lords had kicked the police out of town, and a family moved into the police station the next day. And the cells were their bedrooms. <laughs> it's quite a large family. But interesting, I went to the drug lord and said, how about us? Oh, you're fine. You're doing a good work. You do your work, I'll do mine. I said, okay. Let's keep in touch. If there's any problems, please communicate. It was fine until we had about 30, 35 we had led to Christ who were drug addicts in they stopped using. Now, if you go home and do the research on how 
much average a crack user uses a day or a cocaine user uses a day or look at some other drugs, you will be, you won't believe the amount they use. I'm talking about financially speaking, not in weight. In a year, take that times 30. And when I woke up from the coma, I was kind of deciding what in the world, why would he, why didn't he just ask me to leave town? Why did he hire someone to come shoot me? And I came up with the fact that he wanted to make an example out of us so others wouldn't come in and take business away from him like we did. I figured out that I was costing him between one and two million dollars a year. That's reason enough, I guess. Some folks from the home office came. What now, John? And I said, well, my heart's still in Brazil and there's nothing I can do about it and I'll only be happy down there. God wants me someplace else, he'll take my heart out of Brazil and place it there. But there was something I had to do. I had to forgive these men. The one who had paid for it and the ones who did it. Sent a letter to the paper, the state paper, which would be here. I was going to look it up yesterday. I apologize. Which would be the main paper in Minnesota? Or are there various papers? Is there one in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the main one? Dispatcher? Star Tribune, okay. I sent a letter of forgiveness and salvation to the main paper in the state of Alagoas. And I had verses and references, and they printed it in full. At first, I said, I'm surprised they printed the whole thing, but who is the, who's the owner of, a, of, of, of the cattle on a thousand hills? Our God is. And he saw that I did my part, and from the depths of my heart, I forgave. Was it easy? No, it wasn't. Was it easy to leave the past in the past truthfully, sincerely, so I could... Go back and openly minister with a smile on my face and say, yes, they meant it for harm, but it's working towards the good. I've been places, I've spoken, I have ministered, I have traveled. There are some things I can't do, but there are others that I can do and they have taken their place. Leave the past in the past. Maybe you are here this morning, you say, but you don't understand, I have some things in my past. Maybe God can't use me. Maybe he can. You've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now our enemy, Satan, he likes to whisper in our ear, oh, you, you don't want it. No, no. Remember your past? And he said, well, I better be quiet because I was recently in Chicago in a church and there was a young man there and we were talking and he said, I said, are you involved in the church? And he says, well, you don't understand. My past, and I said, leave the past in the past. I didn't preach this message, of course. I, it was another message. This was prepared for you folks. And I shared with them something that is very important when Satan reminds us of our past to slow us down, to stop us. All we have to do is resist him. 
Why? Because the Word of God tells us to. Resist him by reminding him of his future, and he will leave you alone. Leave the past in the past. Invest in prayer. I thought I did all right in prayer, praying as a missionary, building going on, visitation, church planning, discipleship. But I still had what I thought was plenty of time to pray. I have more time now. And I have found out something that I didn't know before I was shot. No matter how much you pray, there's always room for more. Like you sit down at a table of really good food and you eat and eat and eat and then you who eat too much and you can hardly get up. Prayer is not like that. I prayed enough for today. That'll never happen. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Brazil is the largest Catholic country in the world. I was speaking with a person at the hotel last night, and, and uh, this, this lady, she's uh, from, I always ask, do you go to church? You going to church tomorrow morning? She said, I already went. She's Roman Catholic. And I said, quite interesting. Brazil is the largest Catholic country in the world. When we lead someone to Christ, prayer to them is something normal. Only their prayer is uh, repetitive. They repeat and repeat the same thing over and over and over again. They take the beads off their neck or uh, they get their prayer beads and they pray around their prayer beads. And it takes like 40 minutes to say the same thing over and over and over. The Word of God calls it vain repetition. But they still do it because they think and have been taught that that's the right thing to do. And they pray 40 minutes in the morning and about 40 minutes at night. Wow. An hour and a half a day to a piece of wood to an idol. And before they get up from accepting Christ as their Savior, usually we're sitting someplace and talking and sharing some verses. I have something called a prayer book. It's a little, uh, it's a little notebook. And I have a pen for them also. And I say, this will replace your idol. This here is your prayer book. Just go around asking people for prayer requests and you start from the front to the back with prayer requests and flip it over from back to front and put the answers to prayer. Because God, God likes to be thanked also. And they get so excited, they think every Christian on planet Earth has a prayer book and I'm not going to clue them in on the truth, right? One came up to me and he said, uh, went to one of the churches we helped start a few years ago, and he said, you're in my prayer book. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you're number 35. And I almost went, wait, that's not fair. I gave you the notebook and the pen and I'm 35? I should be number one, right? No. I thought of saying something, but I was so excited that every day 
and probably twice a day like he did before to an idol. He prays for Bev and I and the ministry that we are in. There's another one, and he says, I saved a whole page in my notebook for you and Beth. Oh, wow. Want to see it? I said, yeah. So you opened the page, and it was a page full of dots. I go, whoa, what's with the dots? He said, every time I pray for you, I put a dot down. I said, fill them up, but brother. So if you need ideas on exciting things to do and different in their prayer books, there you go. We have a days of prayer. We start at 6 in the morning, go to 6 in the evening, and every hour on the hour we have a sign-up sheet. A group comes in, sings a hymn, prays, and the next hour, the next group comes in, sings a hymn, and prays until the 12 hours are up from 6 to 6. We had one gentleman that headed the whole thing up. He was there all day, 12 hours. He was getting up there in years. He had a heart attack. And we don't have 911. So they called us. We grabbed him, threw him in the car, took him down real quick, and the doctor saved his life, did five bypasses and some stents, and I don't know what else. I'm not a doctor, so I don't understand. But they fixed them all up, and uh, he said, I have a worry. And I said, worries are wrong for those who believe. And he says, no, no, but this one here is legitimate. Who will take their day of prayer if I die? I said, well, when you come back to church, I'll give you the word, and you'll, you can ask. And so he got up, and he said, uh, if I would have died, day of prayer would have died with me, and is there anyone that'll take it if I die? And Brother Holmildu, one of the gentlemen in the church, rose up and said, I'll do it. I basically said, okay, brother, now you can rest in peace, you know. Invest in prayer. Focus. Now, this is the gentleman that took over the day of prayer there. Actually, the gentleman did finally pass away. What was it? About two months ago. Passed away. And Homildu and his wife, Mata, they're heading up day of prayer now. Three or four times a year. We just let them decide when they, they want one. If they want one every month, I'd probably let them. Because we do believe in the power of prayer. Focus on God's power. Sometimes we look around, I do, I shouldn't. As a pastor, as a missionary, my dad was a pastor, my grandpa was in the ministry also. I should know better. As we look at the world around us, it puts fear in our hearts. What now? And then we, just, we worry about our children. And now Bev and I were grandparents. We have two granddaughters. We worry about them. And when, while we are worrying, we are forgetting to focus on God's power. That no matter what, He is in control. And nothing happens to me or you without passing by Him first. We cannot be touched without God's permission. Focus on God's power. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, 
in necessities, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Focus on God's power. We have a lady in our church, her name is Hita. She started losing her eyesight, took her into a doctor, and they said she needs surgery. They did one surgery. Didn't do much good, did another one. She went blind, totally blind. She went into depression. Some people do, even believers, to be able to try and deal with it. You lose your eyesight. Went to visit her. Mahita, come to church. I have no way to go, she says. I said, what do you do with your day? She says, I sit here and cry day and night. I lost my sight. I shared with her this very verse to try to help lift her spirits up a little, not with my words, but with the word of God. And she seemed to have gotten a little bit more happy and excited about what happened to her and that what happened to her passed by God before it hit her. I said, there are things you can do. Down in Brazil, uh, especially if you go to the poorer part of the city, your wall, and some of you have been to Brazil, so you know this as a fact, Your wall is your neighbor's wall. The houses are in a row, and they're narrow. And uh, your wall is your neighbor's wall, and the next one. And if a person is a good sneezer three or four houses down, you can hear them. It's amazing. No privacy, I tell you. But you're born there, and you're raised there, so you don't know any different. I said, do you think you can make your way around the block? And they're right up against the sidewalk. She says, oh, I've been here all my life. I know almost everyone on my block. I said, just knock on a door randomly and go in and sing a hymn. You have a good voice. You have some verses memorized. Just pray and whatever verse pops into your mind, that'll be the verse for that day. We had Bring Your Visitor Month, and we had prizes. Guess who won? But she cheated. She would come to someone's door and say, Can you lead me to church? I can't go alone. She always had a visitor. But guess what? Some of those visitors accepted Christ as their Savior. Now they're members in the church. We were going to do another competition, but no one wanted to participate because they know she's going to win. (laughs) Leave the past in the past. Invest in prayer. Focus on God's power. Expand God's plan. God's plan is not to only live a godly Christian life, which is at the top of the list, but because without a good upright testimony, we can't go on from there, but to multiply. Something else we do before they get up, we hand them a... We hand them a... a caderno, we hand them a... Notebook... See, I 
forget the English word for it sometimes. The doctor said I'd be a vegetable anyway. When I was in my coma, they informed Bev, oh, if he wakes up, you know, never was that bright. Never got straight A's, so I guess I'm safe. But I hand him the notebook, and I hand him some other little books. It's our discipleship course. We start discipling right off. And we teach him how to be soul winners. Pastor and I were, Pastor Lapine and I were talking for the service this morning. And I said, we have, last count I made, 21 that have gone through Bible school and are now in the ministry to the glory of God. And they're out starting churches also. We have a widow lady down in, she's a blind widow lady. In Kansas, she's 93. She pays for all our discipleship material and literature, which includes tracts. And we have been able to start a good number of churches because we have a vision that We have led someone to Christ and now they are part of the team. And that we want to go someplace else and start another church. So we teach them how to carry on the work and they do. Span God's plan. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. It's a well known verse. Most of you probably know it memorized. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God, uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. There was a town drunk where in a village of São Pedro on a mountaintop, and it does get cool there, not as cool as it does in Rochester, Minnesota. But I've seen it in the upper 40s. And Giovanni was the village drunk. We don't have public intoxication laws down there like we do up here. And on the weekends especially, you will see them on the sidewalks or in the gutter where they tried to make it home after drinking and they didn't make it, they just fell and passed out, and that's where they lay till they come to. His family got saved, Giovanni got saved, got a job, his family was starving, in really bad shape. Now he's a deacon of the church, and He's not only the fix-it guy around the church, like there's a door not opening and shutting quite right because it is the tropics and it gets humid and then it gets dry and the wooden door expands or shrinks. But he's also my visitation guy and he loves to do it. He said, Pastor, you should see their faces. I knock on their door and they look at me and they say, I know you. And they can't remember where they saw him. And he said, I can help you with that. You probably saw me passed out on a sidewalk drunk. I'm not that man anymore. I like to do most of the visitation, but when I have some left over, not enough time to do it, I call Giovanni up and he eagerly takes the opportunity to expand God's plan. May this message here this morning speak to your heart as it spoke to mine. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, to experience the abundant life that God has for us, 
Amongst many other items, you could make a longer list. Leave the past in the past. Invest in prayer. Focus on God's power. He is in control. I drive from the back seat. My wife doesn't like it. <laughs> Don't try to do that to God. He is in control no matter what. And then invest in the future of the family of God by each one of us doing our part. And if you are here this morning and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you must do that today. People come up with questions and ask, do you have any questions? They say, yeah, is there enough room in heaven for everyone if everyone got saved? Yeah. Really? And I said, God is God. There are no limits for him. And so far, that question has been asked by more than one person. They're satisfied. And I hope we can be also. Once again, we want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today. 